Now, the law of this relation of the two sides would have to state the kind of effect and influence exerted on the individuality by these specific circumstances. But this individuality consists precisely both in being the universal and hence directly and unresistingly coalescing with the given universal, the customs, habits, etc., and being conformed to them, and in setting itself in opposition to them and in fact transforming them and again in behaving towards them in its individuality with complete indifference, neither letting them exert an influence on it nor being active against them. Therefore, what is to have an influence on the individuality and what kind of influence it is to have, which really mean the same thing, depends solely on the individuality itself. To say that by such and such an influence, this individuality has become the specific individuality means nothing else than that it has been this all along. Circumstances, situation, customs, etc., which on the one hand are shown as already there, and on the other hand as present in this specific individuality, express only the indeterminate nature of the individuality, which is not the point under consideration. If these circumstances, way of thinking, customs, in general the state of the world, had not been, then of course the individual would not have become what he is. For all those elements present in this state of the world are this universal substance. The fact, however, that the state of the world has particularized itself in this particular individual, and it is such an individual that is to be comprehended, implies that it must ha also have particularized itself on its own account and have operated on an individual in this specific character which it has given itself. Only in this way would it have made itself into this specific individual that he is. If the constitution which the external world has spontaneously given itself is that which is manifest in the individuality, the latter would be comprehended from the former. We should have a double gallery of pictures, one of which would be the reflection of the other. The one, the gallery of external circumstances which completely determine and circumscribe the individual, the other the same gallery translated into the form in which those circumstances are present in the conscious individual. The former the spherical surface, the latter the center which represents that surface within it. Here in paragraph 306 what we see Hegel doing is working out further the implications of the duality that we've already noticed between the individual and the world or the universal, what it is that, that's forming them, what it is that the laws of psychology are supposed to be providing some intelligibility to, explaining for us. How it is that factors outside of the control of the individual, things that impinge upon him or her, form and shape the consciousness of that kind of person. So what we're talking about are things like we put here, customs in, in German Zitten, habits, Gewohnheiten, what, what, what you're used to, <coughs> circumstances, the Umstände, the, the things that, that you know literally are all around you, and the situation, the Lage. And for each of these, people think that they can come up with some sort of generalization. And it's not just supposed to be a generalization, it's supposed to be universal in scope. So let's see how this plays itself out. Here we begin to see the, the role that freedom is going to play within the Hegelian system. In fact, as a sort of a side note, anybody who thinks that Hegel is purely a determinist in the classic sense where everything is just part of one big determinism, and nobody has any freedom, isn't reading these passages. So this is a very important part of the text, prefiguring a lot of what other Hegelians and other people influenced by Hegel who are not Hegelians, for instance, John Paul Sartre, right, and being a nothingness, are going to do with the individual. So he says, the law of this relation of the two sides, the world and the individual, these two sides, would have to state the kind of effect and influence exerted on the individual by these circumstances, by all of this stuff over here. But, and here is where Hegel points out something very interesting, the individual is him or herself already a universal in a certain way. 
How, how so? Well, we're going to see that the individual, and we've already seen this in the previous paragraphs, engages in a kind of adaptation or interpretation of these norms, these sociological or psychological norms that are supposed to have all of the determinative force on their side. It turns out, and again, this prefigures what Sartre has to say in being in nothingness and also in existentialism as a humanism, that it's the individual who gets to decide on some level what to make of those supposedly determining forces. So he says, this individuality consists precisely both in being the universal and directly and unresistingly coalescing with the given universal. The, this is the universal as provided with us. So on the one hand, if the individual allows him or herself to do this, they will in fact be shaped by these forces. For example, when they're inattentive, when they think that their customs or the ways in which things are done in their country, their family, their community is the best way and they don't question that, they, they end up being shaped by it and formed by it. On the other hand, it's quite possible for something else to occur, as Hegel says. So he says, um, here we go, the, uh, and in setting itself in opposition to them, setting itself in opposition to these norms over here, the customs, the habits, and in fact transforming them. Now that's something really interesting to say. It's not just opposition. It's not just saying no. It's not just a refusal. There has to be a process of reinterpretation, of assimilation, of sifting, of deciding what one is going to keep and what one is going to reject. A plain flat no means nothing within the Hegelian system at this point, you could say, really th throughout the entire system. Hegel is a, a big fan of what he calls determinate negation, which means negating but only in a certain way, in a way that has a positivity to it rather than a mere blockage, a mere no, a mere refusal. So he goes on and he says, um, here we go, uh, again in behaving towards them in its individuality with complete indifference, neither letting them exert an influence on it nor being active against them. That's another possibility. You can say, yeah, there's norms in place. I'm just not going to observe them. I understand that they're there, but I'm going to make use of my capacity, my freedom, my option, and just ignore them. So uh, he says, therefore, what is to have an influence on the individuality and what kind of influence it's to have? See, I've got this here. We think of the world as exerting its influence, but really it's crossed by the own individual saying, well, I'm only going to allow this to affect me, and I'm going to allow things of this sort to affect me. And we might also say, we could add in a couple other qualifiers, the why, the when, the how, all of those sorts of things. It's not totally under a person's control, of course, but there is quite a bit of that involved here, much more than people often give credit to. We have choices about what kind of people we're going to be shaped by the norms that we have. So we can say, well, I come from a family that does X, Y, Z. That doesn't necessarily have to determine a person because if it did, then like mechanisms, we would automatically replicate that, that process or, or those norms. So he goes on and he says, these depend solely on the individuality itself. To say that by such and such an influence, this individuality has become this specific individuality means nothing else than that it has been this all along. So there's something going on here in this process, a, you might say, hidden exercise of freedom over time by the individuality. He goes on and he says, circumstances, situation, customs, which uh, uh, on the one hand are shown as already there, right? They antedate the individual. They're already there. We're born into a society. We're born into a family. We, uh, you know, uh, run into, as if we become apprentices, we enter the military. There are norms there in place before us. And he says, on the other hand, they're present in this specific individuality. And this expresses only the indeterminate nature of the individuality, which is not the point under consideration. So he says, if these circumstances, all, all this stuff over here had not been, then of course the individual could not have 
assimilated them, uh, conformed to them, reacted against them, ignored them. They are a given, and the individual does have to exercise his or her choice, her freedom, her interpretation in relation to them. But the fact that there is that play, that slippage, means that it is not simply determined by what the circumstances, by the externals. So he goes on and he says, um, the individual would not have become what he is. All those elements present in the state of the world are the universal substance. The fact, however, that the state of the world has particularized itself in this particular individual, and it is such an individual that is to be comprehended, implies it must also have particularized itself on its own account and have operated on an individual in this specific character which it has given itself. Only in this way would it have made itself into this specific individual that he is. So he goes on and he says, if the constitution which the external world has spontaneously given itself is that which is manifest in the individuality, the latter would be comprehended from the former. What is all this saying? It's saying that in, in this dialectic between individual and world, or individual and culture, or individual and family, individual and institution, the institution and the norms governing it particularize themselves, become real in individuals. On the other hand, the individuals, as the locus of this, are deciding for themselves how this is actually going to play itself out. So in a certain sense, these are, you might, not, you might say, not even really ideals. They are ghosts. They are kind of shadowy shapes floating back and forth. And it's up to the individual how they're going to assimilate that and make them into spirit, geist, right? little play on words there because ghost and spirit in English, two different words, are the same word in German, geist. Oh, well, spirit could be, ghost could be, could be spook as well. So he goes on and he says, um, if the constitution which the external world has spontaneously given itself is that which is manifest in the individuality, right? Uh, it would be comprehended from the former. And then he switches to this interesting metaphor. He talks in spatial terms, and there's a transformation that's taking place here. So he says, imagine that we have two galleries of pictures, and they're reflecting each other. They're, re they're representing each other. They're mimetically connected with each other. He says, we have a double gallery of pictures, one of which would be the reflection of the other. The one, the gallery of external circumstances, the external, right? Which, uh, he, he goes on, he says, uh, completely determine and circumscribe the individual. Or at least we think that they do. The other is the individual. And we think that the relation is just this way, right? But we've seen that the individual and the pictures that the individual has within him or her is not merely replicating or mirroring what's going on in the external world. <clears throat> now, Hegel says that we have a transformation that's taking place here. We can think, instead of about galleries like this, we can think of a sphere, and this is you know, not, not three-dimensional. I'll make it a little bit three-dimensional by adding that. There we go. Now, now, maybe it looks like a sphere to you, maybe not, because my drawing is not the best. What's key about this is that we have the surface of the sphere, right? the, the externality of it. right? And that's that gallery here. That's this, all these pictures here. And then we have the internality, which is the individual, at the center of the sphere. Um, interesting way of depicting this, and it, it's in certain respects more, more realistic than talking about um, galleries facing each other, in part because the individual is at the center of the universe. Now, of course, we have multiple individuals. We'll talk more about that later. But so far as we're seeing it here, what's going on here the, in the individual is deciding the meaning of what is on the periphery. But the spherical surface, the world of the individual, has at once an ambiguous meaning. It is the actual state of the world as it is in and for itself. And it is the world of the individual. It is the latter either insofar as the individual has merely coalesced with that world, has let it just as it is enter into him, behaving towards it as a merely formal consciousness, 
Or, on the other hand, it is the world of the individual in the sense that the actual world as given has been transformed by the individual. Since, on account of this freedom, the actual world is capable of having this twofold meaning, the world of the individual is to be comprehended only from the individual himself, and the influence on the individual of the actual world, conceived as existing in and for itself, receives through the individual the absolutely opposite significance. That is, that the individual either allows free play to the stream of the actual world flowing in upon it, or else breaks it off and transforms it. The result of this, however, is that psychological necessity becomes an empty phrase, so empty that there exists the absolute possibility that what is supposed to have had this influence could just as well not have had it. Now in paragraph 307, Hegel is going to continue working with this metaphor of the sphere. And you, you have to imagine, I'm not the best uh, drawer when it comes to this sort of thing. We've got a sphere here and we've got the individual right at the middle of it. And these arrows that are, that are depicted here are representing the influence of everything from the outside pressing towards the inside of the individual. And the individual we might think of as something like a point at the middle, something that's collapsed within under the weight of sociological or psychological determinism or at least the laws that are supposed to be pressing their influence upon the person. And now you notice that there's one other arrow. There's this one here which I should probably highlight a bit more. This arrow uh, which is the individual and his or her own influence upon, her, uh, upon themselves coming through that, that sphere, breaking through it, breaking through, as, he, as Hegel says, any sort of psychological determinism that is supposed to be affecting them. So Hegel says the surface of this sphere is the actual state of the world. He also says that that's in and for itself, which is a rather strange thing to say, particularly given that we would, we would easily say that the world is in itself, right? It has that sort of beingness of just being, just being as it is. It's a given, as he said in the last paragraph. Why is it for itself? Well, that's because the world is not just a world of mute things, of nature pressing in upon the person. It's a social world. It's a world of other spiritual entities, of other consciousnesses. And that's why it has the shape that it does. That's why the laws that pertain to it could press in upon the individual, because they've been made through the actions, through the choices, through you know the, the history of other individuals. They represent culture, at least whatever culture there happens to be. They represent the pressure of institutions ranging from the family all the way up to the nation state or the you know, culture industry in our own time. And all of that is indeed, as Hegel says, in and for itself. And usually the in and for itself is the end point, isn't it? But here it's just a beginning point because the individual, as it turns out, supersedes. The individual transcends the in and for itself of the actual state of the world. So how does that happen? Well, he tells us. He says the, the spherical surface, the world of the individual, has an ambiguous meaning. Anytime we have ambiguity in Hegel, we have a doubling, a, a, a splitting that's taking place in an important movement. So he says it's the actual state of the world and it's the world of the individual. And it's the latter, either insofar as the individual has merely coalesced with that world. That is one possibility. The social pressure simply exerted on the individual makes the individual what he or she is. In a certain sense, they're an individual in name only. They're really just a representative of what's going on there, sort of like a knight or a bishop on the chessboard that only has meaning in terms of the game of chess. That's not the way human beings most of the time actually are, however. So he goes on and he says, um, the influence on the individual uh, of the actual world conceived as existing in and for itself receives through the individual the absolutely opposite significance. This pressure is transformed. 
He says, the individual either allows free play to the stream of the actual world flowing in upon itself, or else breaks it off and transforms it. So this is very important. The individual determines the influence that the world can have. The individual transforms the elements of the world and the forces, the pressure that it brings, the influences, and decides in some way, not necessarily in any rational way, but in some way, what is going to have that effect upon the individual? What is going to shape it? So the individual is, in a certain respect, self-shaping, but not in a Promethean form uh, of just, you know, Making itself out of nothing. That's not really a Promethean form anyway, but that's often the way we talk about it. Rather, it's doing so by adapting the world to it just as much as it adapts itself to the world. There's often ruptures going on within this as well. So he says, uh, the, the result of this is that psychological necessity becomes an empty phrase. It becomes meaningless to t say that we have laws that tell us exactly how a person is going to behave. That becomes nonsense from Hegel's perspective. So empty, he says, that there exists the absolute possibility that what is supposed to have had this influence could just as well not have had it. Why is that the case? Well, because the individual is the one who decides what in this surface actually does have influence upon them. Thus, there is no question of a being which would be in and for itself and was supposed to constitute one aspect and the universal aspect at that of a law. Individuality is what its world is, the world that is its own. Individuality is itself the cycle of its action in which it has exhibited itself as an actual world and as simply and solely the unity of the world is given and the world it is made. A unity whose sides do not fall apart as in the conception of psychological law into a world that in itself is already given and an individuality existing on its own account. Or if these sides are thus considered each by itself, there exists no necessity and no law of their connection with one another. This very short section of Observing Reason has come to a close in paragraph 308, a very short paragraph. And we see that similarly to with the previous movement in the first section of observing reason, observing nature, where we ran into ultimately a check. We, we weren't able to have laws in the sense that we wanted to have them as something that you know, observing reason could generate for the world. Um, we see that the same thing happens with the laws of thought or their transformation into psychological laws. There is a kind of slippage there. There's a kind of escape on the part of the subjectivity. So Hegel is going to talk about this in terms of ind individuality. This is very important because in the next section, ob observation of the relation of self-consciousness to its immediate actuality, physiognomy and phrenology, we are going to be focusing yet more on the individual and trying to make sense of the individual in terms of his or her body and you know all, all these other things rather than just merely the external factors. Um, here we're seeing that individuality introduces necessarily a sort of freedom which undoes the kind of necessity that we were uh, hoping to gain in, in law. So he says, there's no question of a being which would be in and for itself, that was the world, right? And was supposed to constitute one aspect and the universal aspect of that of a law. The, the world does not determine the individual. Individuality, he says, is what its world is. That's a very interesting thing to say. Individuality is shaped by the world, the environment that it takes in, that, that it allows to form it to some degree, but against which it, it reacts also, or, or reshapes it, or reinterprets it, and decides what it's going to take, uh, take from the world and, and allow to determine it or to condition it, and what it's going to say, no, 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 I'm going to ignore that or reject it. And Hegel will talk about the cycle of its action, the cycle of the individual's action in this case. He says it is itself the cycle of its action in which it has exhibited itself as an actual world. And simply and solely the unity of the world is given in the world it has made. So 
What are we talking about there? The individual, of course, is not the entirety of the world, but the individual is kind of the privileged node from which the world makes its sense, from which the world has its meaning. And we could say, what about multiple individuals? Hegel's not concerned with that at this point. He's just looking at the single individual. Or you might say, if we want to think ahead, the individual in the abstract. But he also does talk here about two important things, the world as given, that is the world that uh, psychological laws thought they could look at and say, aha, now we know everything about the factors that are going to shape the person, and the world as made. What it means to be a human being <clears throat> is in part not merely to accept givens, but to transform them into something new, or even something old if we want, but it's still us transforming it. It's still the individual, the human being, doing that through its action. It doesn't necessarily have to be in any sort of uh, very self-conscious way. This is something that we all do all the time. When kids are making their way into school and figuring out their place in the pecking order and determining how they're going to fit in or even the style of you know, how they're going to behave in the cafeteria in relation to the other kids, in relation to the space, in relation to the traditional already established there, uh, when they innovate and, and do something new, when they you know, resuscitate something that kids uh, you know, several generations before them had done that they have no idea was done before. That's what we're talking about here. When people in a workplace uh, decide that they're going to do things in this way using Microsoft Word and have this go around, that's part of what Hegel's talking about here. This is not something that necessarily has to have you know, massive, abstract, world historical connotations. This is something that we can all relate to in our everyday life, in our institutions of the family, in our institutions of uh, how we consume and enjoy things. Uh, Think about what you do with your Netflix or your YouTube, uh, you know, watch later queue. Any of these sorts of things can be understood in this way. Our, our clothing can be understood in this way. Our appearance, our interactions with each other. Get yeah, waxing a little bit prolix here, but I uh, want to get back to the main point. He says, um, if those sides are thus considered each by themselves, there exists no necessity and no law of their connection with each other. Why don't we have a law at this point? Because individuality is calling the shots. These things are actually connected together and perhaps even unified. The world as given, the world as made. Individuality is deciding what's going on. And at this point, we really have a Hegel who sounds very, very much like a certain you know, uh, later French philosopher who will use Hegelian categories but is not himself a Hegelian. And I, again, leave that to you to, to figure out, to read between the lines. We are now finished with this subsection and ready to move on to the next subsection of observing reason.